words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. So I don't know if something was wrong or she was just waiting. In a couple weeks, on May 13th, the women will be getting together here at the church for a women's brunch. I highly recommend the women go to this. They are very encouraging. I know how Catherine is, um, has run them before. And, um, and you might have already been a part of... Um, one this year if you've been around this year this is also a good opportunity if you have a friend in life that that you've been praying for and thinking about uh and you're not too sure if they would ever go to church with you on sunday this might be um a way to get them connected um to the church ultimately and and to um, other women in the church uh, that can encourage them and befriend them along with you so put that on your calendars and get ready to um to enjoy this time of fellowship and devotion together as women of the church. Um, we're going to um, look at John chapter 6 as we consider why we're here. This is, a, um, this is our call to worship. This comes from Jesus himself. Jesus declared that I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. As I say pretty much every week, we always... We all come to church because we have uh, something we, we, we would like to get out of being here. Uh, and Jesus reminds us that we actually need to come to see him today. And all the hungers and thirsts of our life that we're coming to church to maybe satisfy can't be satisfied at all unless they are found in Jesus, unless we actually come to him and uh, receive his, his grace and his direction for our life. So. Uh, I want to consider that this morning as we um, then respond to this call of worship that God um, gives every, every week to all his creation. So let's take a minute now to pray. Father, I thank you for this morning and for this time to gather again with, with your people and uh, this church family. I pray you would uh, bless us now as we um, just just do, do the, the same thing we do every week, a sim simple uh, simple things like worshiping you and hearing from your word. 
I pray that these simple, ordinary things would work in us extraordinary change over time. And would you refresh us again in your grace and allow us to leave here filled up with courage and encouragement uh, for the lives and callings that you've given us all. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, worship is what you were created to do, and <clears throat> nobody has to tell you to do it. We all naturally just worship something, and uh, the, the challenge of being a Christian, the challenge of coming to know God and, and Jesus Christ is, is the fact that we have been reoriented in terms of our understanding of what worship is really all about. Worship is delighting in, actively delighting in, and participating in that delight with who God is. And uh, we, have a, um, we have a God who enjoys his children. And sometimes I think we can kind of, you know, we walk into church or we, you know, we get into our worship places at home or in the car or wherever we might be. And we just go, all right, I'm going to worship now. And God's like, why don't you just enjoy? Why don't you just enjoy my presence? Um, our first worship song that we're going to be doing this morning, the, the, the very first line in, of it is, water you turned into wine. You ever think about that? Jesus went to parties a lot, if you read the Gospels. And in the first one that's recorded in John, he actually brought the drinks. This is our God, right? So he wants us to enjoy his presence. He wants us to enjoy just being in his presence and delighting in him and having him delight in us. And, you know, while it's a serious thing that we do when we worship God, it's also, it should be our delight. It should be our heart's delight to sing uh, joyfully to who our God is. And so as we sing our, uh, our opening song this morning, again, whether you sing it or not, can you just delight in who God is and, and the fact that he's made us to worship him? and to enjoy him. Let's just sing this song together. Stand together. Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one
praise for the fact that um, for all of the ways, Lord, in which maybe we have um, worshipped other things and in our hearts and in our minds, uh, Lord, in our spirits, and we have, with our actions, declared that other things are uh, of more importance than you, Lord. We just confess that to you now, and we declare uh, in the presence of your people, in the presence of your Holy Spirit, that uh, you are the only God worthy of all of our praise. You are the only God who has loved us as we are. You are the only God worthy of everything that we are, Lord. And we can say that because you gave everything for us. So, Lord, who are we to hold back? Who are we to, uh, to, to worship false idols and the things of this world? Lord, we worship you, and we worship you alone. And may the worship of you uh, delight our hearts as we gather together uh, in a spirit of worship. We pray these things all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. message paraphrase says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me 
Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. mention um there's a church in connecticut in eastford connecticut that uh burned to the ground this morning at 3 30 this morning so um through a network of pastors that ethan knows uh he got that uh prayer request this morning so we just want to lift them up uh during this during this time so if you'll just join me in prayer father god we take a moment out of our crazy busy schedules for the most important thing we can do any day, uh, but even maybe even all week, is just to stop and to recognize that you are king and you are sovereign over everything. And it's only because of that that we actually have hope, because if we decided to look at the world for our source of hope, we would be, we would be overwhelmed. We would be crushed. We'd be broken and beaten down because... The world is just, it doesn't have what we need. Only you have what we need. And so we look to you and we come before you and we just long for you to fill us with what we need. And Lord, I just want to lift up uh, this congregation in Connecticut that finds them without a building, but we know that the church is not a building. The church is the people. We pray that you just give them comfort and give them strength as they 
figure out what their what the future is going to look like. Um, I pray that you will give them uh, the ability to trust in you and to put their faith in you during this this uh, troubling time. And we thank you that even though the building may have been lost, we thank you for people who are willing to make a career out of putting their lives in, in the line of danger. And so we just want to lift up our communities, firefighters and and policemen and other first responders. I pray that you'll just uh, be with them and just keep them safe and get them home to their families. I pray you'd be with the military, people who serve both here and abroad, that you will just be with them as things continue to escalate in multiple different areas around the world. I pray that you will uh, just give the world leaders wisdom. And despite how things may end up going, I just want to remind us and help you, have you remind us that you're sovereign. And that no matter what is going on in the world, that we can trust that you're, you're in control and that, again, that's where we're going to find our hope. I pray you'll just be with Ethan as he comes and uh, delivers the message that you've put on his heart. I pray that you'll give him uh, boldness and, and conviction to say the things that you have brought into his mind. And I pray that you'll help us to be receptive to what he has to say and that we will take the things that he says to heart. I ask all these things in your name. Amen. We're going to be reading out of Philippians uh, chapter 1, reading verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry, out, carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the, with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer. That your, lo- that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and what may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. One personal fear that I have in life is progressively becoming like Grandpa Simpson looking for an excuse to be angry at something, just goes outside and starts to shake his fist at the clouds. It seems, from my perspective, there is no shortage of older men who are filled with anxiety and anger and frustration, despair and pessimism as I look around. And and I'm thinking, as a younger guy beginning pastoral ministry, is this just what life adds up to? Is this what happens, just I guess, from decades of watching the news and looking at what's going on in our world year after year? Is this really what, it, what, what I have to look forward to? But then I met Dennis Johnson. My first year of seminary was his last year in seminary as a professor. He was an old man, and he was actually the last of all the professors who had been there at the founding of the seminary in California. And everyone who who knew Dennis Johnson knew that he was a man marked by joy. He had this aura of peace and comfort and warmth that you would be swept up in if you were around him. But I've seen so many guys live his kind of life and actually turn out the opposite, cold and hardened. Why not him? Was Dennis Johnson ignorant of all that he should have been upset about and despairing in at that point in his life? Well, well, that couldn't be because, I mean, just aside from his own trials in life, he actually uh, had been a pastor as well. So, so he saw so many lives and trials and hardships 
right in front of him as he ministered to a church. He also saw these sorts of lives through the seminary students. So on top of his own life and, and the decades of serving others, he, he, he's, he certainly wasn't ignorant of all that we could have been despairing over. Yet he was still marked by joy. Well, and on top of that, he, he knew perhaps better than anybody else what the end times were going to be like because he wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. So what was the difference for him as I've been studying through the book of Philippians, preparing for our, the series we're starting today, these are the kind of qualities that are illuminating from Paul as he's writing to this church. This opening passage is sort of summary for all sorts of things that we're going to see in his letter. And, and he paints the big picture here in these first 11 verses of, of what it is as a church we ought to be aiming for and how we ought to be aiming for it. Now, Paul in this church of Philippi go way back. We can actually read of when the church began in Acts chapter 16. He knew all of the founding members of the church before they were ever even Christians. He watched them come to faith himself. And he says in verse 5 that from that first day until now, the church of Philippi has continued to support him. The church itself has grown and developed as he addresses in his opening introduction. Uh, overseers, which is synonymous with elders and deacons. So this church has actually developed uh, church officers. It's been a while. It's been at least a decade now since the church began that Paul is now writing back to them. And he's writing to them as a grandfatherly figure, as someone who is uh, near the end of his life. He's acquired wisdom. He's been through hardships. And yet his parting words are peace and joy that he wants for them to have as they press into the callings uh, uh, as a church that they've been given by God. And as he actually is still uh, courageously uh, in prison, pre trying to press ahead to his own calling that God has given him. So how can we have such joy and confidence and encouragement? And how could Paul have such joy and confidence and courage? Speaking to the next generation. Do you see a lot of older people speaking to the next generation like this? He's writing from a prison cell, as I've said, and he's at the back end of a long and hard ministry. Paul was not crazy, nor was he out of touch with what was going on in his world and what was going to happen in the future and how much more difficult it can get. We read about all his trials in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, yet he encourages them to press ahead with joy. So this is where we find the main idea of our passage it's this, that because God gives us joyful confidence in his work, we can have a loving unity in our church. So two big things that we see in this passage, joyful confidence, loving unity. And those are um, two or three headings that I'm, I'm going to use to walk through this main idea. So first, joyful confidence, then second, loving unity. And then third, we'll see the final goal. Is God desiring tr the church in America in 2023 today to have this kind of joyful confidence in him? The kind that Paul encourages them to have in verse 6. Well, the answer to that question is yes, he is. But it's not because um, times haven't changed. They certainly, times certainly have changed since Paul was writing and to what we're dealing with today. But the reason is because Although times have changed, God has not. It's because God hasn't changed that we're actually called to have this same joyful confidence as we pursue loving unity in the church. So I'll read verse 6 again. Paul says, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Now, our church here, Forestdale Church, was founded in the mid-1800s. We don't know exactly when it was founded because the, um, the records uh, were burned uh, in, um, a, as a um, town, a building was destroyed that kept the records. But the tale goes that a man named Mr. Fish, who was a whaler, fisherman, who was a resident of Forestdale, which at the time was known as Greenville, he donated the plot of land that's right behind us, right next to the cemetery, so that in the hopes that a church could be founded. Well, 
perhaps maybe his own ship, I don't know, but a group of whalers came back from a really successful haul out at sea, and they um, raised and donated a large sum of money so that the church here could be built. But to the wise and humble person looking back at the history of how our own church was founded, you would know that there's still one person who's very important to this story that I haven't mentioned yet. And that's God. God working over and above and in and through all of these circumstances to make sure that this work begins. He was there all along, seeing to it that his own purpose would come about. Now, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the Philippians, remembers back to how it all began for them, for the church in Philippi, and how it was so clear that God divinely um, started this work himself. He divinely directed Paul to go to Philippi. Paul wasn't even planning to go to Philippi. Maybe Paul didn't even know about the town of Philippi. But look what we read in Acts chapter 16. Luke records this account as he's traveling with Paul. He says, they went uh, through the region of uh, Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but... The Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia to help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea um, and sailed straight to Semothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city in the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. See, I was so clear. God divinely started this work in the church by directing Paul to go to Philippi. But but the story gets even more, um, um, goes even grander than that when we see God's initiative work. The very next verse talks about how God divinely called the people of Philippi themselves to be in that church. Verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women that were gathered there and a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to hear what Paul, in respond to what Paul was saying. She and her whole household was baptized, and she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, stay in my house, and she persuaded us. Well, in the the narratives that follow, we read about how they um, heal a demon-possessed slave girl, and how that causes actually an uproar in the city because some people were making a profit on her. And so they get thrown into prison, Paul and Timothy, But then God miraculously um, delivers them from jail with an earthquake, opening all the prison doors. And the jailer is so nervous that he's going to get executed for losing everyone. He's about to kill himself. Paul sees him. Paul stops him. The man knows this was a divine act of God and asks Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul shared the gospel with him. He came to faith and his whole household came to faith. God himself was divinely calling even the church itself, the people of this church, to this work. Do you think it is any different with you? Do you think that it's any different with us? Sure, you may know the times and the dates and and the places and the names and the influences that all surrounded the circumstances of our church being created and also uh, the faith being created in you. But don't discount and forget about the most important person to those stories. To rephrase something that Jesus said in John chapter 6, uh, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So we can put this in a positive way and say it the opposite way. Everyone who comes to me, the Father has drawn. So Paul writes that since God began this work in you, he will be faithful to carry it out until the day of Jesus Christ, the final day, the last day. Simply put, if God began a gospel work in you, 
He will never stop. He will never stop until it is finished. Therefore, despite Paul's clear understanding of how difficult life and ministry uh, and, and can be under persecution, he was able to share joyful confidence to the next generation behind him. I remember where I was when 9-11 happened. I was in elementary school sitting in Miss Carpenter's class. And all of a sudden, a mother of one of my classmates burst into the classroom and starts frantically grabbing all of her daughter's things, not knowing what if, if it was the stuff that's supposed to be in the classroom or the stuff that was her, her own daughter's, and putting it in a bag and saying, we've got to go, we've got to go. It startled everyone. She left, and it felt like a tornado had just whipped through our classroom. But later that day, when I found out what had happened, I wondered, why didn't my mom get me? Why didn't all of our parents get us? Didn't they know what happened too? Or was she the only one? Didn't they think that theoretically this could also happen here? Well, I'm sure the answer was yes. They all knew the same thing that this one mother knew. But the fact is, that's no way to live your life. That is no way to live your life. Frantic, desperate, controlled by fear, driven by anxiety. Now, when it comes to the Christian faith and the Christian life, and, and we're bunkering, bunkering down, we're trying to grow, we're trying to um, help our church, we're trying to connect with God and grow spiritually and reach people. As we're trying to do this and, and looking at what's happening in our culture, it's frankly embarrassing to see how many Christians look like that mother bursting into the classroom, controlled by fear, frantic, desperate, driven by anxiety. That is no way to live the Christian life. So long as Philippians 1, 6 is still true, that is no way to live the Christian life. When it came to Paul's life and ministry, it was actually the opposite that was happening. When things got tough, they got more bold. The very next verse, which will open next week. Verse 12, Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, his imprisonment and his pending execution, has actually served to advance the gospel. And he says, it's because of my chains that most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. When trials came, it actually emboldened them. So we have to step back and ask an honest question today. Do you believe, do I believe, that God is still as in control as he ever has been? Do you believe God is still able to begin and complete whatever work he wants to do? How much do we really believe Philippians 1, 6? If you're an older Christian who finds yourself increasingly worried and anxious, I don't blame you. You know more than me. You've seen worse things than I. But stop giving in to fear and fix your eyes and trust in God so that you can turn to younger Christians and, and help them grow in love and joy and peace and the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul was doing for this church and as Dennis Johnson had done for me. And if you're a younger Christian in your faith, be discerning about who you listen to. I'm sorry to have to say this, but there are some older Christians that you need to make sure you avoid. They are not going to help you grow in the fruit of the Spirit being around them. Find those who will. Find people like the Apostle Paul. Find people like Dennis Johnson who actually sweep you up in the aroma of the fruit of the Spirit that it's exuding from their life and figure out what it is they're looking at which is making them that way. They're certainly not sticking their head in the sand like an ostrich and unaware, 
But there's just something much greater that they know is happening despite how bad things look. So in order to fulfill our calling as Christians and our task as a church, we need to be fueled by a joyful confidence in God. We've got to have this. In God's own express commitment to work in us until Christ returns. Now, but up until this point, I still haven't defined what is the task of ministry God has given us. What kind of church has God called us to be in? And, and where should our joyful confidence in God drive us to? Paul summarizes it in verses 9 and 10. So we've come to the second heading now, loving unity, loving unity. I'll read verse 9 and 10 again. He says, and this is my prayer for you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. Paul is referring to the loving unity that a church needs to have in order to come together to make the right decisions as a church. We'll see specific examples of that uh, later in the book of Philippians, the kind of decisions that they need to make. But a couple of questions are, are in order to unpack this second point. First, how does joyful confidence in God help us grow in loving unity as a church? What do these two things have to do uh, together? How do they relate? Well, disunity in the church and fear could be, not always, but could be revealing a lack of confidence in God. When we try to force our own way or we simply uh, quit and go somewhere else, when a problem arises rather than sorting through it together, it could be, not always, but it could be revealing a lack of confidence that God is still here at work. It could be revealing the attitude that, well, I don't believe God can work with that anymore, so I'm out. But what if we believe God was still at work in here? If we truly did, maybe we would find it easier to love one another and to work together to find a good solution. God knows the issues uh, that we're dealing with right now in, in our church. And not that we're dealing with, like, big issues, but... But he, he, knows the, he knows the decisions that we have to make. He knows the decisions every church has to make. God is aware. And on top of that, God knows the people you have to deal with in this church while working through what it is that we're all about. Have you considered that God might be present over and above it all and just waiting and watching to see how you will respond? If you'll trust in him, it, it kind of reminds me uh, of the best way to get through boot camp. If you've ever gone to military boot camp, you'll remember, like I remember, uh, two types of people that you're training in boot camp with. You, you have the one person who's just like starry-eyed, shell-shocked, who's nervous and crying all the time. You have to baby them. The whole platoon has to baby them just to convince them that they can get through it. And it's, and it's great if they get through it. But then there's the people on the other hand who are calm and, and serious and it's not really phasing them that much. And they might even laugh a little when the drill instructor isn't looking. Well, how could, how could they be like that? Well, it's because those kinds of people, category two, they know that this is all part of the plan. This, the, the craziness and stress is actually all part of the plan. It's all part of the purpose. The person who's shell-shocked thinks it really is random. And so that's why they're so nervous, because they don't know what's, what else is coming around the corner. The other person is saying, well, I, I don't need to know what's coming around the corner, because whatever it does, I know it's already been premeditated, it's already been planned, and it's actually working towards developing me and my character so I can be more equipped to be the kind of person I need to be. When we have a confidence in God we can experience joy and confidence, even in difficult times that we don't expect. Knowing that he's over it all, working something important out in us, in all of us together as a church. Therefore, we can demonstrate a loving unity together as a little platoon as we're working towards the goal he is bringing us toward. 
But here's a second question that kind of befuddled me when I was working on this verse, or as this work, verse was working on me. When it comes to trying to solve a problem, what does love have to do with it? Paul writes that love is going to abound. He's like, I pray that love will abound and bring you towards discernment. Lead towards wisdom. Lead towards knowledge and insight. What does love have to do with learning? Well, is there someone in life that you never really noticed before or always thought was kind of boring until one day when a random topic is brought up and all of a sudden they just open up and just you can't, and you can't shut them up now? They're really excited. They're telling you about all this, the, the, the stuff that they like and all the details of how this thing works or the backstory. And they're totally nerding out. And you're like, wow, I didn't know there was so much to this person. Well, what happened? You found something they love. You found something they love. And the things that we love drive us to learning about it all the more. This is why Albert Einstein said, everyone is a genius. Everyone is a genius about something because everyone has something they love. We learn, when we learn about the things we love and, and a problem comes up, what happens? We actually take the time to figure out how do we solve this? We look under the hood. We go slow. We're curious. We want to know what went wrong. But when we don't love a thing like your you know, car, you know, whatever, you, 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 just, you just plow through it and you, sometimes you break it because you, for, you force your own way or, or you give up and you throw it out uh, before trying to uh, look into it anymore because you don't care. But not those who love. Not those who love. This is the kind of church Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi to be. The kind of church God desires every church to be. A church that is marked by loving unity. Paul is, is describing how their love for one another ought to work its way into helping them learn and discern and see what is best. Now notice, he's not, gonna talk, he's not talking about what is right and what is wrong. He's saying what is good and what is best. Because actually, maybe 95% of the decisions we make as a church is not between what is right and what is wrong, but what is good and what is best. The elders of our church meet twice a month. The deacons of our church meet once a month. And all the members of the church, we meet for a business meeting twice a year. And we all discuss all sorts of things about our church, and, and, and we work together to make decisions about what we should do. And, and did you know that most of the things that we have to discuss are not moral issues, they're practical issues, meaning they're not usually about figuring out, is this a sin or is that a heresy, but about should we upgrade this in our church facility or upgrade that? Should we use this color paint or that color paint? Should we do this outreach event or that outreach event? And there's no wrong answer. It's just between what is good and, and what is best. But even though most of the decisions that churches make are not moral issues, they still have the potential for causing division, for putting a wedge between us, for fostering bitterness even. And so later we see in Paul's letters stuff like this. In Philippians chapter 4, he, he writes, I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind. Being a part of a church means that we need to make decisions together, and, and making decisions together means we need to love one another. Imagine if we loved one another the way that we love our secret hobby. I think it would really help us for when we have to make decisions together and go on mission together. So that's how this main idea works. Because God gives us joyful confidence in his work, we can have a loving unity in our church. Do you see what's at stake here? If we don't get this right. If a church is cluttered with despairing pessimism about the future... In other words, if we don't have a joyful confidence in God's work, there will never be a, a loving unity among her members as they seek to make decisions. Fear and doubt will always drive us to selfishness and disunity. So we need to fix our trust in God. We need to be confident not only that God is the one who began a, this work in us, corporately and individually, but that he is the same one who is committed to carrying it on to completion. So we've come to 
the final heading now, the final goal. Just to conclude briefly, lest we be like Forrest Gump, who made an ambitious run across America without a clear goal in mind. Let's conclude looking at the final result that Paul talks about in this passage, the finish line. What's the end of this race? Where we have been fueled by joyful confidence in God's work to pursue love and unity in our church. Paul says he'll be faithful to complete this work in in us in verse 6. But then in verse 10, the end of verse 10, he says what that work is. He says that we would be pure and blameless at the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. As I said, Paul has already mentioned this day, the day of Christ. It refers to the second coming of Christ. The day when Christ returns from heaven to judge the living and the dead and to consummate his kingdom reign over all creation, as he says in Acts chapter 1. The word for pure here can also be translated in slang as the real deal, can be proven as the real deal. It means to be unmixed uh, with lower quality ingredients. For us, in a moral sense, it means to be without hidden motives. It's like the difference between two marble statues. They might look the exact same, but what happens if you accidentally uh, chop off an ear as you're chiseling a marble statue? Do you know what someone would do? They would take wax and put and mix the wax with the clay and reform the piece that was broken. But what happens when the sun comes out? It melts the wax. And the ear, the nose, or the toe, or whatever, starts to droop. And, it, and it's proven to be impure. At the day of Christ, all people will stand before God. And everyone will be exposed by the radiance of his glory and his truth. And Paul's desire is that the Christians in the church of Philippi would stand through that judgment and be proven as the real deal. Arm, all marble, no wax and unable to be accused of being impure. That's what blameless means. Because they have truly been hidden in Christ through the Holy Spirit, a church that loves one another to such an extent that they learn the art of coming together in unity proves itself to be authentic. A church full of the Spirit of Christ, true partakers together in God's grace. The way we live As Christians, then, as we look back at all of this, the way we live, the way we do business as a church, the way we act, it matters. It really matters. As we see in these final verses, it will either be to the praise of God's glory and grace, or it'll be to his public shame to a watching world as they look at us. It will either bear the fruit of righteousness in us, which comes by being united to Christ, or it will bear the fruit of pride and discord, which shows that we're not walking with Christ and we might not be united to him at all. So let us persevere together in loving unity, joyfully confident in God's work. We should be smiling every Sunday, by the way, joyfully confident in God's work in our lives and in this church so that we could glorify God as God looks on us. Let's take a moment now to pray. And just to consider these things, bring your heart before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning you've given us to gather and worship you, for the opportunity to look at your word and to let let your word do its work in us. I pray we would receive it with faith and be encouraged that you still speak you still speak today and we get to hear you and be reshaped and renewed and re-encouraged again as we press on in the tasks of life and ministry you've given us in christ's name we pray amen
closing song. Take my life and let it be. scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 and 21. This is God's blessing for you today. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.